Welcome back to Road to the Rocket Launcher, the show where we recap and analyze the design of Resident Evil through the ages. On today's episode, the horror series goes next-gen for the first time, from PS1 to Dreamcast. We're looking at 2000's Resident Evil Code Veronica. Resident Evil Code Veronica, the adventures of returning Claire and Chris Redfield on a new zombie-infested island, was directed by Hiroki Kato, another alumni of the first game's development team. It was developed by a separate team alongside Resident Evil 3, so they were both released very close together, and as a result, they were, I guess, unable to learn from each other that much. I mean, <clears throat> that's actually total conjecture on my part. I have no idea if they were in contact during development or just didn't want to exchange ideas. I mean, it is the same company could have given each other a ring if they really wanted to. Code Veronica doesn't feature certain elements that 3 introduced, like the admittedly awkward counter or the ammo crafting system, but it does still include the 180 degree turn, thank god. Unlike 3 though, there are some other cool additions, like dual guns being able to target two enemies at once, not bad. You can also use a health item on the spot off the ground if it won't fit in your inventory at the time. Nice. Though I kept mashing and wasting the items when I didn't want to anyway by accident because I'm such a speedrunner. If you look down at your controller, the Dreamcast's VMU screen will even show your health status, which is of limited use, granted, since the character's body language will inform you generally of how they're doing. But if you want a little more detail, it's a nice way of getting that information quickly without pausing the game, albeit while still requiring taking one's eyes off the action. This is cool though because it means there's still a bit of challenge involved. You can risk a quick look at your status without stopping the game if you're a pro, or just in an empty room I guess. Despite these ideas though, Code Veronica still doesn't let you move freely on stairs. You have to hit a button and the character auto walks up them. Even 3 on PS1 got rid of this and let you tackle stairs in your own time. Of course, the main difference Code Veronica exhibited over 3 was the use of fully 3D environments. Even at the time, using still images for backgrounds was starting to seem antiquated to some. When stuff on the PS1 like Capcom's very own Dino Crisis was using 3D environments before Resi 3 came out. And while we can debate all day over which method looks better, in this case it's hard to compare the two techniques when Code Veronica also gets to be on a more powerful system. Purely on a gameplay level though, this change does have quite a bit of merit to it. In the original games, you were looking at still images, so other than cutting to the next one, the most the camera could do was pan up, down, left or right. Here though, the camera can swoop in or cool and dynamic and track the player for longer as they move around. This also eliminates the few frames of loading that could occur every time the PS1 Resi games switched between backgrounds. Here's the thing though, now that the levels are fully rendered in 3D, I kept getting the urge to adjust the camera or position it behind me like it was possible in the previous year's Silent Hill by Konami, another fully 3D horror game. And this would have been possible since the game goes as far as to include first-person weapons now that let you survey your surroundings, and even a first-person minigame is unlockable. They just didn't want to implement free camera control. In the original three resis, it would have been impossible to do this, but now that it could have been possible, enemies you can't see off-screen feel a little cheaper to me. You know, when I know there's no technical limitation anymore that would prevent some degree of camera control. I think the Silent Hill approach of a freely controllable camera that gets fixed in place for certain tension building situations is the perfect middle ground for this kind of thing. And honestly, that kind of covers most of the gameplay updates here. The graphics are fancy in real time, uh, there's some cool lighting effects, but there isn't anywhere else that the game innovates in much. The rest of the title is very bog standard Resident Evil gameplay. Despite this, Code Veronica does feel very weird and uncanny, despite the quite rudimentary Resi gameplay, and that's probably because of its bonkers storyline. My grandfather is one of the original founders of Umbrella. While major Machiavellian antagonists and ancient lore dating back decades was something the first three games held at the periphery, Code Veronica dives headfirst into aristocratic bloodlines, the founders of Umbrella, and their weird Riddler wannabe children. Consider the area you are in a special playground I have prepared just for you. I so want to enjoy this. 
Even Wesker, who keep in mind at this point in the series was just some guy who double-crossed you and got owned in the first game, is now back for some reason with superpowers darting about, and yet still once again gets kinda owned and ends up feeling even more irrelevant. The title moves away from Western, modern-day American horror to focus more on that gothic stuff, and it's not a terrible idea. Kind of a throwback to the lordly mansion of the first game, literally at times. When you're in the midst of that stuff, Code Veronica definitely has a charm and a style. Unfortunately, half the game is spent in bland, generic warehouses which do very little for me. The story has a lot of grand concepts in mind. You play as two working-class siblings who take on aristocratic, insane incest twins. There's talk of heritage, ancestry, class. The villain literally compares herself to a queen ant, using biology and genetics to control others. But you're never going to think about these themes and elements that much. The protagonist certainly don't bother, and of course it's especially hard to take it all seriously when the game is caught up in such cheesy direction. Wait! I... I can't! From the voices, to the music, to the dialogue. Yeah, I don't know, I just really don't want my horror game stories to have the mood of a telenovela. Anyway. The game starts with a nice little self-contained bit of exploration to kick things off, combined with that first trial-by-fire introduction to Resi's enemy encounter approach, where enemies can easily overwhelm and really maim you good and end your game quickly if you're not on your toes. This Resi starts off still fairly challenging in the combat department, but paired with a more simplistic bit of exploratory gameplay, which is a fair enough compromise, I suppose, before overwhelming the player with a big open environment to look around and get chomped on in. Not many places to go yet, so if you die here, you won't have to recoup much progress, etc, etc. It starts with less action than 2 and 3, but with less initial freedom than 1, so it's a bit of a cautious opening for a resi game, to be honest. Please deposit any metallic items you have in the security box. I actually do kind of like what they do here, though. You have this corridor that you can't enter with any metal, so it unnerves you a little by making you defenseless, asking you to leave all your stuff behind here. But it also subverts Resi tropes a bit by forcing you to make a replica of a weird metal emblem crest key thing, so you can take it through the metal detection corridor to the door it opens. Which is funny because it implies the ornate antiques being used to open doors and access deadly secrets in the series so far could have just been replaced by cheap replicas. After this, you get access to quite a few areas at once. The palace, the training facility, and of course, course, the prison you were just in, which does need to be detoured back to eventually. It gives the veneer of scope, but you can't do much in the training facility until you've messed around in the palace and grabbed a pirate wheel that lets you dip, literally, into an airport for another key that opens up more of it. The game funnels you down here to let you know, hey, it's time for a classic collect the three things to progress resi mission. But it's basically a formality to include this trope since you'll stumble into the first two just lying around on your way to the third one. They might as well have cut this whole facade and just given you an airplane key rather than a third trinket. The hunt for the quote-unquote three seals needed to get on this plane will take you back and forth from the prison to the training facility to the palace to, I guess, another second separate mansion castle thing too? And it almost hits a nice sweet spot of multiple places to explore at a given time. There's optional rooms and secrets to find. There's even two of the same item that can be used to access two different areas in whatever order you prefer, mixing things up. Nice. Choice and strategy, I like it. But it all falls a little short here and there. There aren't really multiple ways to get to the big key areas, and this linear setup could have been easily fixed. Getting to the prison, or the palace, or the other palace is going to take you down one route. Not much thinking can be done about which way to go based on remaining enemies and such, because you don't have much choice when it comes to getting between these places. Enemies respawn a lot too, you get an inventory expansion very early on, gone are the days of carefully planning what to take with you when going between item crates, get your guns out, go down the one route over there, and hope you have enough on you to deal with whatever's in the way. Of course there were choke points like this in all the other games, but this is the standard gameplay loop here. We're so far away from one where there were nice solid segments of choice in terms of how to get from one place to another. It gets repetitive. There's a bit where you gotta go all the way up to this second castle thing, and then just go all the way back. If you choose to use one of your two shield things in the facility to get a key card there, to get and use the second shield, you're gonna be going all the way up to palace number two, then all the way down to the prison, and then back up again when you're done. 
The design of these smaller key areas aren't as refined or as easy to pass as the RE1 mansion or the RE2 police station either. It's hard to navigate off the top of your head in the training facility, for example, with rooms and corridors just piled on top of each other at random. The game's map also straight up tells you which doors you can now access when you have the appropriate key, which makes sense here when there is so much accessible at once so far away from one another. But a more condensed, tight, memorable layout for all these areas to exist together in would have probably made this handhold unnecessary. It feels like they wanted a bigger environment for the player to explore this time, which I commend. When you get access to the second mansion and more of the training facility and the prison all at the same time, it really feels like there's a lot to do and a lot of options. You even have the choice to give this guy from the start of the game some medicine in exchange for a lockpick, which other than opening up loads of optional resources right here right now, has repercussions for obtaining special items and events all the way late into the game when you have to switch characters, it's cool. But it is like they threw all this in and didn't think too much about how compelling navigating it all would actually be in the moment to moment. Something that feels super unthought out is the first main boss after gaining access to the plane. Not a single person I've talked to about Code Veronica hasn't brought up how they got completely screwed over by this boss. I'm talking plain tyrant, ladies and gents. Okay, so the structure of Resident Evil, limited resources for saving, healing, and shooting things, inherently means it's possible to really back yourself into a corner if you play poorly. But usually this is mitigated by the player being able to load up their last save, wherever it may be, and maybe go looking for more resources if a room or a boss has them stuck. In Code Veronica though, save here before Tyrant's first form, or here before his second form, and you're stuck at points of no return. If you don't have a backup save, you're super out of luck against this guy if you don't have much to your name. All you'll have otherwise is whatever you already saved and you're granted very generous resi item crates that allow you to retrieve any item left in one crate from any other crate in the game. So you can get all that stuff out on the plane because it has one of those, but being just a little bit short on items is going to put you in a bind here. He hits really hard and takes a lot of punishment. You know, it's not like his first form on the ground is a super interesting boss fight or anything either. It seems like it's just designed to waste your ammo. You shoot at him until he goes down. Uh, until you do, you can't move forward. Do it fast or he kills you. Great, okay. Even if you've really screwed up though, it is usually always possible to break out the knife and kill your roadblock taking no damage. Though if you've messed up enough to need to do this, you'll probably struggle to go in knife only on anything. A Code Veronica is a funny one though, because you can end up without the knife in this fight if you left it in those item boxes at that metal detection corridor and not in the universal item crates. Or I guess if you decided not to pick it up at all. So basically this part of the game is overall a giant danger point for everyone playing, and I don't think there's been a time before this in the series where the finite nature of obtainable resources was handled this sloppily. Keep some backup saves, and uh, that shouldn't be a problem, because there are so many ink ribbons in Code Veronica, there's like no chance of you running out. My ink ribbon resource was never on my mind. I bet you could save almost every time you enter a save room in this game and you'd be fine. While the You Died screen is remarkably cheap looking here, a continue option was also included, so you can opt out of going back to the main menu when you expire. But surprisingly, unlike previous games, the option will sometimes load an invisible checkpoint rather than the location of the last typewriter save at. I mean, I think this never happened in previous games, maybe I was just too good to ever stumble across a non-typewriter checkpoint in those, but I'm pretty sure they didn't have any. Or maybe I've just forgotten, you know, I'm not perfect. In Code Veronica, you usually get these secret checkpoints at certain boss fights, or moments where the trek from the last typewriter would have been kind of frustrating upon death. But this makes the rules of dying super inconsistent. When will retry load the last save point, and when will it not? If I want to go for broke on a boss and sacrifice a lot of resources to beat it because I'm scared of redoing a lot of content, that's kind of undercut if I later find out there was a cheeky hidden checkpoint there the whole time. Again, kind of sloppy design. If the environments were more thought out to make typewriter locations more accommodating to a player after their demise, this might not have been necessary, but as the game is now, yeah, I guess the hidden checkpoints here are for the best. It's for the best I don't have to redo so much stuff if I die to some of these bosses. Seems like though, if the game didn't want the player to redo busy work, creating levels that didn't require redoing busy work 
uh, would have been a better solution than playing fast and loose with when and where respawning happens. After the Tyrant fight, the Antarctic base is pretty drab, and this choke point on the map with the respawning poison moths is super grim, but it ends in a visually cool boss fight, albeit one marred a bit by how hard it is to dodge air. <laughs> I don't know if it's possible to make such a move not frustrating to try and avoid. Also, being in t-shirts outside of the Antarctic? Yeah, I'm sure that's doable. At this point, the game switches over from Claire to Chris as he retraces her steps at the training facility. Code Veronica doesn't feature an advertised Resi 2 style swapping system where you get a choice to leave something for the second character when they come through at certain points. It's more of a secret swapping system. All the items you leave in the item crates will be available to the opposite character. You're not really told this, but your success as Chris is going to be affected significantly by what you leave for him in the interconnected item crate. Don't take what you want Chris to have with you to that Nosferatu boss fight. Later you get one other chance to play as Claire for a minute so you can once again leave Chris some stuff. But you have no way of knowing how long this segment as Claire is going to last and whether or not you should be holding on to those important items. The first time through, I have no idea if I'm going to need that grenade launcher as Claire here until boop, I'm um, back as Chris. Hope you didn't want that stuff she was carrying. It's less of a tactical decision and more of a whoops, wish I had known that kind of moment. Chris's first section back in the training facility feels like busy work this late into the adventure. Fumble through this area again with certain paths blocked off before getting on a plane to go to Antarctica. It's not terribly compelling. It's kind of a decent challenge to navigate, but being in this place again isn't really riveting. It's not a very exciting location. I kind of like how you have to abandon the shotgun to go to certain parts of the level. Using a weapon as a key is quite novel, I suppose. It's just not really blowing my mind. Story-wise and gameplay-wise, the training facility as Chris is a bit of a dud. Also at this point, I was noticing that the lock-on function, unlike in previous titles, was actually messing up a little bit when it never did that in the original three games for me. <laughs> Don't know why you're aiming over there. In Antarctica, things pick up again with a cooler mansion level, but you're still, you know, collecting three colored gems to open a door. It's, uh, it's not breaking new ground either. Though it is nice to see the final level of a Resi game be an actual level, as opposed to just like a couple of corridors with a linear series of items to collect. So I guess when it comes to the complexity of the levels throughout the entire game, Code Veronica is a little more consistent than the other titles. But four games in, I don't know, collect three doodads to open a door? It's something to do with the finale, but they really didn't think outside the box that much, did they? I'll be honest, it's a bit hard for me to get excited about it. I know, I'm just never happy about how these games end, I'm sorry. And plus, it's all kind of ruined by one of the most obnoxious moments in Resident Evil history. This monster jumps up, but instead of being like an actual boss fight, you just have to run away Crash Bandicoot style. Though if you just turn around and do that, guaranteed he's gonna kill you. The best way to get away without expending a single bullet is to run into him so that his shitty Resident Evil turning speed will give you enough time to escape. Because that's totally what I do in a situation like this, run into the monster. Yeah, I'd prefer if my survival horror strats required a little more logic. The boss fight Chris goes up against next is considerably more fun than that by virtue of like being a fight where you attack a monster with a gun and move around, you know, classic stuff. But the final boss fight is this super annoying cluster of shit coming at you. Little bugs that bump into you and big ass tentacles coming out in this confined space. Resi boss fights have never been complex, but I've never been like annoyed the same way I was here. It's also worth pointing out that there are a bunch of boss monsters in this game, but only Tyrant, Nosferatu and Alexia are actually mandatory. The rest I didn't even mention because you can just grab the item and run away like the snake in Resident Evil 1. And it's a bit like, well, why would I waste resources fighting these things, you know? It's usually not much of a choice. The worst that's going to happen is this thing is going to shock you a bit. Underwhelmingly, we get a launcher that doesn't shoot rockets, but instead some kind of energy blasts, alright. Gotta be all special, do ya? I've whinged quite a bit in this video, but Code Veronica is a pretty safe bet when it comes to resi design. It's standard stuff. 
I'd even say it shines when it comes to optional content here and there, and the breadth of places to go, variety of weapons, etc. Despite being considerably less refined than usual, there's still catharsis to be found in these classic gameplay loops. It's just there's nothing really that new mechanically to really spice things up compared to past entries at this point. And that might be enough in terms of pure gameplay, if Code Veronica was a stylistically super unnerving, spooky experience to enjoy, alongside the usual puzzle solving and combat. The problem is... FATHER! Uh, it isn't. Ah! Code Veronica just isn't very scary. So take these stretchy arm goofsters. They can navigate the environment better than almost any previous Resi monster. So you'll be like, oh, uh-oh. But are they unnerving or that spooky? Uh -huh. Not really. A lot of the enemies in general feel like they could be in a T-rated action game. These poison hunters? Come on now. Clean the blood off the zombies, and even their designs are a bit lame this time. The only enemy to unsettle me was probably the Nosferatu. But otherwise, the title is seriously lacking in original cool enemies. Big spiders and worms don't really cut it anymore. Game's gotta resort to, like, lame audio stings. Oh no, regular zombie enemies, oh no. Seeing these zombies roam around this generic, sterile warehouse environment straight out of Blue Stinger or something, it makes them feel like a joke at this point. You know what isn't very scary? Hunters appearing because you failed a tank-controlled Metal Gear Solid level. It's just silly. Now, it's one thing to make a super crazy wacky game that isn't super scary if the gameplay and its pacing falls in line with it. But Code Veronica still has super slow-paced, methodical resi play that now can border on getting a bit boring if the parts in between all the slowly opening doors, time-consuming inventory management, and empty foreboding locations are just a bunch of bog-standard action sequences with little tension. The deliberate, slower gameplay in resi of this era needs better horror than what Code Veronica delivers to justify this pace. Even Resi 2 was more exciting in an action sense with all its uh, rooms chock-a-blocker full of enemies, while still being spooky in other areas. Back in my analysis of Silent Hill, I gave Resident Evil its dues for inspiring the kind of gameplay loops and structure that Silent Hill implemented. Silent Hill clearly took inspiration from Resi's mechanics while reducing much of their complexity, but it would be unfair of me to make note of that without now bringing up how, in terms of style and presentation in the horror genre, Resident Evil got schooled hard by Silent Hill, and Code Veronica seriously fails to up its game in response. Resi 3 introduced Nemesis, a relentless, unpredictable pursuer, which kept that game's horror fresh, building tension in a really cool way. Steve? But with Code Veronica, building tension and making the player feel uncomfortable comes across like it was barely even a concern for the devs. <clears throat> like maybe they figured that would sort itself out on its own after the new graphics and story were in place. Uh, but it don't. Background music can be dull and just kind of apathetic sounding. And before you say anything about these comparisons, yeah, Silent Hill has a worm kind of boss too, but one, it's actually a caterpillar, and two, it's way cooler. If the original Silent Hill had a spider too, I'm sure it would be badass. You never really stumble on anything that macabre or interesting in the environments visually for something that's supposedly about body horror and mutations and biohazards. Just rooms with corpses, some blood splattered here and there. And as I said, the monsters? Straight goofy most of the time. The Umbrella Corporation being this faceless, soulless entity was much more unnerving than this guy. <laughs> and the doofus from the first game who got owned showing up with superpowers. When the game ended and the equivalent of 80s sitcom outro music started playing over the credits, I seriously started wondering if the devs knew what kind of game they were even making. It's one thing for Resident Evil to be a bit cheesy here and there, it's another for it to feel like it's an excuse for not even trying. Instead, just ending up lame as a result. This is lame. It ain't rocking, it ain't sad and touching, it's not charming. It's 
just a bit actually cringy. The tiny bits of romance and stuff in Resi 2 felt way more earned and charming than the melodrama here. And in terms of being just cool and badass, it can't hope to touch 3. Tonally and stylistically, Code Veronica is a miss. Overall, yeah, playing it, it's another satisfying Resi puzzle to put together, but it's hard to say that it contributes all that much to the series. The gameplay is acceptable, but a lot sloppier than usual. The game world setting does little for me outside of a handful of areas, and the story, while a fun spectacle at its best, doesn't really lend itself to making the gameplay itself more interesting. The playable leads are so wet and dull here too, it's not that fun to be along for the ride with them. Claire and Chris are boring as heck here. It's not a resi game I look to replay, there's different ways to approach some stuff, but it's one campaign with no different endings like 1 and 3, and no multiple campaign remix system like 2. Code Veronica Super feels like a next-gen game of its time. Selling itself on the new cutting-edge graphics and letting innovation and considered gameplay slip by the wayside. Resident Evil fans will get some fun out of it, but Code Veronica comes off as tacky and dated in a way the PS1 trilogy doesn't. Controls and mechanics that have a reputation for being clumsy and awkward that in retrospect work just fine in the first three games, in Code Veronica are implemented considerably sloppier. And as a result, I would rate this one more as just a fun curiosity for diehards, rather than as any kind of essential horror title you need to experience. And that's a shame, because this is the first time a main Resident Evil game wasn't one of those. Next time on Road to the Rocket Launcher, the series Godfather returns to recreate the game that started it all. How does it compare to the classic of classics? Stay tuned to find out. Thanks for watching. Road to the Rocket Launcher is a Patreon-funded show. One of the many contributions such funding has had to it is the footage you saw in this video. Through the purchase of a Dreamcast VGA cable, new capture device, the StarTech, and the OSSC Upscaler, I was able to capture some of the best footage around of Code Veronica off the original Dreamcast hardware. Only the best on TGBS, baby. Road to the Rocket Launcher, it's important. It's a way of life for some, I get it. Every other version that isn't the Dreamcast edition features new cutscenes and stuff, and I wanted to stick to the original release here. If you want to consider supporting, head over to patreon.com slash thegamingbritshow. There's a bunch of neat little extras over there for all backers. And of course, shout out to my top ones that are scrolling past you now. Peace out.